I wanted to do negative option. A negative option, of course, is very common now. Negative option is that you sign up and unless you cancel actively, we automatically keep billing your credit card every month. Right, like the gyms do. And, yeah, exactly. Like almost every subscription service does. Reed was thinking, that is so scammy. That is so sleazy. That is v borderline illegal. And I'm going, every single magazine in the world works that way. Almost every single other continuity program in the world works like that way. It doesn't have to be sleazy. You can be upfront, you can make it easy to cancel, but just let's, let's just assume they're gonna like it rather than assume that they're not gonna like it. And to my, uh, to my credit, I managed to convince him to test that and that's the test that blew the doors off. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark Randolph. I'm a serial entrepreneur, perhaps best known as the co-founder and first CEO of Netflix. And you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. I can't remember who it was. I was listening to a podcast and she was going, you wouldn't like walk into a store and say, I'll take all that. You got to try things on and, uh, and see how they feel and see how they fit. And I think it's exactly the same. You know, it, whatever you think is pretty meaningless. It's what you do and find out through experience that I think is the valuable thing. Yeah. So you're a direct marketer. You've got all these sort of entrepreneurial ideas. How far away is that from Netflix? Uh, pretty far. <laughs> I mean, probably 15 plus years. I mean, I had the combination. I was in the direct marketing business, but I was at the same time either starting companies or being right there as companies were being started. Um, you know, we started a magazine uh, and I was circulation director for the magazine. So from a startup, but that was the direct response component of starting a magazine. Then launched uh, two mail order companies, then came out to California, um, helped turn around another mail order company. And it was only after that mail order company got sold, uh, we, I turned the company around and sold it to a company back east that I said, I'm not leaving California, this is pretty nice and began casting around for what to do and ended up working at a big software company, building out a direct marketing function for them, selling their software direct. Okay. And that's what got me my foot into the technology business, seeing how software was made, how software was sold, understanding that whole market. And it was only at that point where um, I left I ended up transitioning from there to general management. I ran one of the big divisions of that software company. Then went with two, two friends of mine, started a 100% technology company that was doing this really geeky software quality automation product. I mean, the kind of thing you can't explain to your mother. Um, mm -hmm. And that was in some ways the entry because when we sold that company, about six months after we started it, the company we sold it to happened to have been uh, founded and was being run by a gentleman named uh, Reed Hastings. And that ended up being an extremely fortuitous meeting for me. What year was that? That was in 1996. And this company, this small geeky quality automation uh, <laughs> company was tiny. You know, we had nine, 10 people. So nine of them were consigned to these basement offices to form a business unit in this big software company that Reed was running. And it turned out that he had an opening as VP of marketing at this company. So I was yanked from this little cerebral job um, formulating the go-to-market strategies for this little company. And then all of a sudden, boom, running marketing for this multinational, multi-thousand person company. Um, and we did that for only about six to nine months more. And then lightning struck again, uh, and we got an offer to sell this big software company. Uh, and this time, uh, there was um, no job for me at the big new software company. Uh, and I was going to be out on my own. But I was being out on my own with that wonderful kind of Silicon Valley golden handcuffs way, where they say, you got to right. come to work for six months. I will pay you, we'll invest your stock, you have an office, and you really have nothing to do. We're just waiting for the deal to close. Right. And Reed Hastings was also going to be out of a job. They already had a CEO, and he was in the same boat. And I said, I'm going to use these six months to start my next company. And Reed uh, wasn't quite so eager to start another company. He was going to go become an educational philanthropist. That was his plan. 
uh, but wanted to keep a hand in. And so we came to an agreement that we would come up with an idea together. Uh, he'd be my angel investor. Uh, he'd be my board chair. I would start and run the company, and off we went. And this is back in- So you guys were tight, very absolutely, tight. Absolutely, because when, it, it, when I said that it was really fortuitous that I ended up bumping into Reed Hastings when his company acquired my company, the other little bonus was that it turned out that Reed lived in the same town that I did. So Reed and I began carpooling to work together and had six mm. to nine months of car time to get to know each other, both professionally, but more importantly, personally. Which is why yeah. when all of a sudden we were both out of a job and said, let's start something together. We were already starting from a position of trust, respect, um, and the recognition that it would be really fun um, to do something together. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned those car rides. It's, it's so interesting to me. Like some of the places that you least expect sort of, you know, the magic to happen or a great idea to come that's when it happens it's in you know it's in a car ride or you're you know you're sitting in a coffee shop somewhere or you're on a hike or maybe you're snowboarding with someone climbing a mountain and all of a sudden you know you get this inspiration and so how quickly did it evolve into a big idea <laughs> well you know i i'm a little i'll challenge you again on the big inspiration idea because although listen that we all love that epiphany you know, where all of a sudden, boom, there's the idea fully formed, ready to go, but it doesn't happen that way. Um, Reed and I, for example, were looking for ideas for a long time. Um, and there was no singular aha moment. I mean, because we were brainstorming all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, I, I, was, I had some criteria because of all those years in direct response. I saw the internet coming along and I knew that I had to do an e-commerce play that this was direct marketing on steroids. Um, yeah. I also was really keen on doing something that had high degrees of personalization uh, because I was at the point where we were just starting to see direct marketing be able to really use personalization. Um, but other than that, I was wide open. And I remember pitching Reed you know, ideas. One of them was uh, personalized shampoo that you would cut off a lock of your hair and you'd mail it to us and my team of hair scientists would formulate a custom blend just for you, and you'd subscribe to it. And then Reed, of like course, it. he's the analytical type, and he's telling me all the reasons it's not gonna happen, so that idea gets abandoned, and then I pitch like, I don't know, another one was custom dog food, where we formulate it just for your pet, for their breed and their age and climate, whatever. And then yeah. that was also abandoned. And then I pitched that we would do video rental by mail, which is even a more ridiculous idea. I mean, it's a big category. This is an $8 billion category, but locked up by Blockbuster. There's one on every corner. Right. And worse, back then, video rental was on VHS cassettes. And because of all my experience with like shipping things using Federal Express, uh, I knew how expensive that was and how fragile they were, and that idea got abandoned. So yeah. if there was an aha moment, it probably happened about two months later when Reed got in the car on the commute and said he had read about this thing called the DVD, this little plastic disc that was in test market that held movies. And he wondered whether that might allow us to dust off that old video rental by mail idea we've been kicking around. Instantly, yeah. we did the thing that entrepreneurs do when they all of a sudden think they've stumbled onto something that could unlock the problem. And it was not rushed to the office and working a business plan. And it was not working on our pitch deck or getting onto a shark tank or any kind of stuff like that. We turned the car around mid commute and drove right back down to Santa Cruz where we lived and tried to buy a DVD but it was in test market, so there was not one to be found. So we settled for buying a used music CD and mailed it to Reed's house in this little pink envelope, like a greeting card would come in. And that very next morning, when he picked me up to go to the office, he just held up the little envelope with the unbroken CD that had gotten to the house in less than 24 hours for the price of a first class stamp. Um, and that probably was the moment where we went, wow, this 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 might work 
So I was I was at the big studios. I was at Universal Pictures in the late '90s, heading into the 2000s, and I was in home entertainment. And guess what we did? It was video on VHS and DVD. Even video on demand was was just coming onto the scene. But it was the early days, and you're right. It it was blockbuster video for rental business, or it was the sell sell through, or uh, sell inside via Kmart, Walmart. Best Buy, Target, Kroger, you know, grocery drug. We're going, you know, back when we had this idea, and this actually, that car ride probably was in early 1997. Listen, I'm, a, I'm not a movie guy. This is not like Reed and I were spending our car rides debating who the best French directors were or who deserved the 1976 Oscars. I mean, my kids were like young. I, I watched probably 90% of my movies were Lion King or other Disney things. So uh, I go, maybe mm -hmm. we should learn a little bit about this video industry. And I remember going, and you, I'm sure, you, I might've even seen you there, went to the VSDA which is the Video Software Dealers Association, which is the trade show for the video industry. And it was huge. I mean, it was the entire Las Vegas convention complex with that, you know, 6,000 square foot booths and larger than life Barney. And I mean, it was terrifying in a way, but it drove home to me the immensity of this business and actually what we were up against if we thought we were actually gonna be able to compete uh, to get a foothold in this crazy business. Yeah. No, it, it's hard to put it into perspective if you, if you weren't in the industry. I mean, going against Blockbuster or any other distributor was like climbing Mount Everest. It was just like... It, it was even more so because at least people who climb Everest, except for the first, at least knew it was possible. But the, um, it's hard to picture the immensity of what that is. I mean, at the beginning, so we, we, uh, we launched, okay, so we, we, uh, we, we had maybe $100,000 that first month. Okay, so it's a million dollar run rate. And we're going, oh my gosh, a million dollar run rate. We, are, we have made it. And then you go, how, how big is Blockbuster? And you go, well, a single store does about a million dollars. We go, well, that's not bad. But there's, there's 9,000 stores. I mean, he's, this company is doing six billion dollars a year. It's just the idea that you're ever you're ever going to take that on is just like absurd. That's what an entrepreneur does, you know. <laughs> you know, but at, at the same time, the lesson I see there, and probably what you guys saw as well, is like you don't have to be first. Uh, you could also be number two in that market if it's if they got six billion dollar market share. You know, even second place, yeah, third place someone, is not it's, a bad it's place the to sales be. force uh, uh, model, which not their model, but you someone say they owe a hundred billion dollars in sales, whatever it was. You take one one percent of their business, you've got a one billion dollar category. And not so bad. So you're right. Even being a, a, a distant second um, to Blockbuster would have been uh, would have been okay. But you know, our aspirations were much more curiosity driven. Just could we get could we, we didn't use the word disrupt, but fundamentally we were thinking, could we invent a different way for people to rent movies? I mean, it was so fundamentally a flawed process. We just couldn't imagine there wasn't some way to profoundly make it better. Yeah, and there were a lot of mistakes, right? It was so disappointing to go in on the weekend. You can't get your favorite movie and... It was, I mean, listen, I got to tell you one thing that that aspect that it's a mess i mean the due dates the late fees the fact that you can't get the new release you want but i mean blockbuster actually had an internal term for it and they called it managed dissatisfaction that was a fundamental principle of their business model and you have always got to want to compete with a company that has managed dissatisfaction as a central tenet of their business model well and now it's pretty easy to see you know, the evolution or the hindsight, right, of, of the experience and breadth of your career as a direct marketer, as someone who really found the joy in the personalization and the one-on-one -on -one contact with the customer and satisfying the customer and, and apologizing to that degree, you can see why it all just was sort of the perfect storm and worked because you had all these elements that you had prepared for. Another great lesson that we shouldn't overlook, which is 
nothing goes to waste, right? Like, so you maybe you did this door-to-door -door sales and you thought that was, you know, I'll never get that part of my life back. Or, you know, you worked this job or that job. But really, if you're careful about it, nothing goes to waste as you continue to sort of build your career or experience brick by brick. And then pretty soon you've got Netflix, you know, at your, in the palms of your hand and, and you can go back to and pull, draw from that experience that you had back in the day. It's brilliant. Yeah, it is so true, which is going back to the very beginning of our conversation where I was saying so many people are so stressed out about what they want to do and they kind of want this predictability. They, which I think is what draws so many people into careers like investment banking or law or medicine because there's some degree of predictability to it. But life, life isn't linear. I mean, I was a geology major of all things. Um, and I largely have spent my life following my curiosity. And it works out. And even writ small, even being in the entrepreneurial space, um, you if you spend your time thinking about will this idea work if you're trying to nail it down so you know that it's going to work you're never going to get started because it's impossible it, it, everything once you get three steps in the future is completely opaque like life and the only way to do it is to start and see what's around the corner by starting down the path it's just a it's probably one of the most things that I'm perhaps most proud of is that this ability to say, I'm just going to start. I'm just going to try something and let's see where it goes. And the more success I have, the more thrilled I am by what I find around the corner, the more confidence it gives me to take an even crazier first step next time. Sort of getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is definitely a trait if you can learn it you know some some of us are born with it and we feel more comfortable with the un, uncertainty unpredictability not being able to see what's around the bend and that's fine but the other part that i want to address is the ego which is and and maybe you know i don't want to pin it on a certain generation because we've all gone through it but it's like there's a job in front of us a, an opportunity and we don't take it because it doesn't look great or it's not what we imagine we are worth we sort of attach our identity to it or not to it you know, I'll never do this or I'll never do that. But going back to your life lesson, had you not gone through some of the things that you'd gone through, you wouldn't have had that experience that now you're drawing from when you're running this company, which would be, you know, so disruptive and amazing here in 2021, right? Um, or when you even started to see the traction that if you hadn't done that, you wouldn't have had that kind of success. So. It's ego sometimes gets in our way. It's uh, playing it safe gets in our way. I think it's a good point. And not being lucky gets in our way. Yeah, <laughs> there's a big degree of that too. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's funny because, you know, one of the big, I have this big, not regrets, the wrong word. I kick myself, you know, because when we launched, you know, Netflix, this company that everyone said would never work. They were all right. It was a terrible idea. It didn't work. It took us a year and a half to kind of find the business model that actually finally would unlock um, unlock this. Uh, and the business model that finally unlocked it was a combination of two things. It was this no due dates, no late fees, keep the disc as long as you want model, and subscription. And this was probably experiment number three. 1,649. I mean, I tried 1,648 other things before I got to that, uh, to trying to get DVD rental by mail to work. And I kick myself because as you're talking about, life is kind of a collection of these previous experiences which you figure out how to fit together into something that'll work in the future. And why I didn't come up with subscription earlier. I mean, I was a circulation director. I knew continuity programs, but it was just so remote that even I couldn't make that jump to think that maybe you could make DVD rental by mail subscription. And But you know, and, in your defense, um, at, at that period of time, subscription stuff was sort of, I think there's a stigma that it was really low quality, almost like... Um, like a trap, a scam. Because remember those, uh, like Columbia Records or whatever they were, like publishers, right? Like yeah, they cool. would sell you a, a book for a penny or a, or a what? What were they selling? 
Uh, 11 records for a dollar. Yes, 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 yes. And it was like, oh, that's a trap. I'm not doing that, <laughs> right? So in your defense, I mean, maybe it was like, oh, that's already been tried and that doesn't really work and there's not much adoption yeah. there. I wanted to do negative option. And negative option, of course, is very common now. Negative option is that you sign up and unless you cancel actively, we automatically keep billing your credit card every month. Right, like the gyms do. And yeah, exactly. Like almost every subscription service does. Reed was thinking, that is so scammy. That is so sleazy. That is v borderline illegal. And I'm going, every single magazine in the world works that way. Almost every single other continuity program in the world works like that way. It doesn't have to be sleazy. You can be upfront. You can make it easy to cancel. But just let's, let's just assume they're going to like it rather than assume that they're not going to like it. And to my, uh, to my credit, I managed to convince him to test that, and that's the test that blew the doors off. So let's fast forward a little bit. Um, you're no longer with Netflix. Uh, you're on to other things. You know, you're writing books. You're speaking. I would assume you probably got a couple, a couple of other companies or pocket ideas. What are you working on now? What's the evolution of Mark Randolph? Yeah, it's funny, you know, I, when I left Netflix, this was back in quite a while, more than almost 18 years ago, you know, I said to myself, I'm not sure I have it in me to start another company. Uh, not that the ideas aren't there, not that the energy or enthusiasm is, but they're seven by 24, and I had other things I wanted to pursue. And the model, but you need your fix. There's no way I'm going to walk away from the startup world. I, that's, I, that's just like breathing to me. And so the fix for me is I go, I'm going to figure out a way to engage myself in other people's businesses in a way that's not fully in. And I began mentoring other early stage entrepreneurs. And the model at the time was I got pretty deeply in. I'd spend a lot of time, enough to really understand who their customers were, what their product was, their competition. I'd know their co-founders. And it was fantastic because it gave me that feeling of sitting around the table with the really smart people solving the really interesting problems. And then I could go home at night. Uh, I wanted to be aligned fully with the founders, that if they did well, I did well. But I never wanted to be the situation where if I had preferred, for example, then I had a different interests than they did. Because I, my interest wasn't the economic. In fact, my interest in wanting equity was for them to take me seriously rather than just want my name on the pitch deck. And so, but uh, it was much more because I wanted that challenge and that fix of being part of a business. Um, and I've pretty much been doing that for the last uh, 18 years. I, I did get sucked in. I got pulled in uh, with, before I knew it into pretty much a full-time job starting another company called Looker Data. Um, which ended up being a six, seven year saga, which we sold um, about a year and a half ago to Google, um, which was great. But uh, the, I, for the most part, that's how I get my fix. You know, and listen, for years, ever from the beginning, besides the companies I mentor more deeply, I'm always getting calls from people saying, could you spend some time? Could you help me with this? Could we talk this through? And I love doing that. I mean, even, even even this week, in fact, right before you and I are speaking, I spent an hour um, with two entrepreneurs helping them work through some cultural issues at the um, at the company. Perhaps the other thing which um, you know you didn't didn't mention is that most recently I realized that you know these calls there's value besides just the person I'm speaking to, and I began recording these calls, and then about. Um, a year ago, and I decided I'd start sharing them with people. And that led to, just a few months ago, launching a podcast, which is, for the most part, just letting people listen in on my mentoring calls. So I, I'm leaving the speaking to people who are well-known to people who do it so much better than I do, like yourself. And I'm speaking to the people who are just getting started, who are struggling with an idea, or trying to take a side hustle and make it real, or trying to take a company which is already going and bring it to the next level. And it's just fascinating hearing the things they struggle with, the th type of problems they're trying to solve, crazy ideas they have. It's a, it's a perfect fix. So where do you see the white space right now? What, what are you focused on or what are you excited about as an emerging category or emerging business? What should we be looking at? 
It, it's the, my answer is not going to be a, a particularly uh, engaging one because I don't pay attention too much to the technology. I don't try and predict where the world is going. For the most part, what I'm really doing is teaching people how to be prepared to take advantage of wherever it goes, how to put your, how to think like a startup. Um, the reason, the way that I pick either who to invest in or who to spend time mentoring or who to coach is, do I like the people? Um, it's entirely um, the people. Um, do they have the right blend of persistence that they'll keep plugging away? Are they creative that they can come up with new ways to try ideas without actually building them all out? Um, do I believe they can hear? Are they bullheaded about what they want to do? Or can they actually listen to someone else's opinion and factor that in? And then most importantly, do I enjoy spending time with this person? You know, if I, because when you're helping someone and it hits the fan, you're on the phone all the time. And I've realized that if my phone buzzes at 11.30 at night and I look over and wince, then I've, I've made a bad choice. I've got to like these people. And then they, they drag me in to some fascinating categories. I am working with a company who's doing AI right now. And it's remarkable being tutored in this new category by people who've spent their entire professional careers doing it. Another company I'm working with um, is a robotics company. They're building a robotic dishwasher, if you can imagine that. And it is just fascinating. So I don't try and say, ah, crypto, I'm going to invest in crypto. One of these days, I'm going to meet an entrepreneur who has a fantastic idea, who I think is really clever and persistent, and I enjoy spending time with, and they'll teach me about crypto. How about, um, what's something surprising or new that you've learned about yourself? I think, you know, I, maybe I just speak from experience that, you know, I have a little bit of life experience now. I've been doing this for a little while, and sometimes I get complacent. You know, I read a ton, so I'm, I'm reading lots of new books. I'm trying to learn. I fancy myself a learner, so I don't mind doing something for the first time. But sometimes I get stuck in the trap and discover that I am still thinking the same way I did five years ago or ten years ago. What's something that you you you're, you think about differently now compared to say five or maybe even a decade ago? Now that you have all this hindsight. So uh, this one came when I got invited to spend a week on Richard Branson's private island. Uh, and I said no. Uh, and then I told my wife that I just got invited to spend a week. And, and then, of course, that decision was reversed pretty quickly. Um, but the reason I, I'm starting it off that way is actually uh, he has a big charity that runs periodic events uh, at his houses. And this one was for a woman's business organization from Australia. And the theme was um, finding your purpose. And it was for successful business women who had achieved everything in business that they had hoped, but were still wondering, now what? And they wanted me to come speak about the methodologies that I had learned about how you take an idea and turn it into reality. And I said, no big deal. I'll go. I'll spend an hour, do my thing. And then my wife and I will head to the beach. Win-win. But, you know, I sat and did my thing. And then went back and I figured, oh, well, I'll spend a few minutes and hear what this what's your purpose thing is all about. And I was sucked in. Like, it was like they were speaking to me. And hour went by. My wife showed up. She goes, where the hell are you? And I go, sit down, sit down. And we spent spending the whole time in the conference with the women. And the reason it spoke to me, and this is not that long ago, this is probably five, six years ago, and I realized that I've largely because of things that I was not responsible that happened for at Netflix after I left, all of a sudden I can show up to speak and I'll have 10,000 people who show up to listen. Or I can write an essay and get written by tens of thousands of people or I can do a book. But what's, what's the point? What am I doing with that? And it made me realize that the things that I'd learned over my 40 years as an entrepreneur, all these tips and tricks and secrets of how you take ideas and make them real were these universally valuable skills, way beyond just people who are trying to be successful entrepreneurs. And I, what I've realized is that's kind of my purpose. And that is a new revelation for me, that it's no longer for me about 
how do I make money at this? It's not about how do I return shareholder value. It's can I help entrepreneurs or anybody really take this idea they have and make it real? Can I give them that same shot that I had because people helped me along the way? Right. And that's just given clarity to everything I did. It's why I did the book. It's why I'm doing the podcast. It's why I mentor. Um, it's why I'm happy to speak with you uh, today. It's just, it's, it's the purpose. Uh, so I have a follow-up question. That's a terrific capstone to what sounds like an amazing career. What if we flipped the pyramid? You know, I sort of was imagining Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, like, first you need, like, you know, food and water, then you need shelter, and then, you know, fulfillment is up towards the top, which is kind of what you're talking about. If, you know, having a purpose, being fulfilled, loving what you do, making an impact, doing work that matters. But would you suggest, well, and, and then the assumption also is that sort of comes as you have all those base needs met, you know, okay, I can pay the bills, you know, I can buy milk and Cheerios, I can go snowboarding or skiing on the weekend if I want to. But would you, would you recommend, like what if we flipped that over and, and you did that reverse style when you first started? Would it work the same? I do a huge amount of work with early entrepreneurs, people in university or younger sometimes. And that has got to be the single biggest challenge to life is h how much is enough. Uh, you can certainly say, I'm going to start pursuing um, happiness right now. Uh, and I see tons of people who are doing that every day on the streets of Santa Cruz. And, and I can't speak for them about how fulfilled they genuinely are living, you know, in a tent largely. Um, but I've also seen people, and I'll put my father in that category, or I'll put all the other successful people in the town where I grew up who spend their entire lives waiting for retirement. Um, and by the time they retire, they can no longer do all the things that would have made them fulfilled. So when do you stop? But one thing I've learned is that the thing that I did learn really early, and I'd say this was when I was in my late 20s, is that the thing that meant most to me, that my yardstick was going to be balance, that I had to, I couldn't wait on one of the balance points. And for me, there was three balance points. And one is clearly I love entrepreneurship. I love starting companies. I love solving problems. I can't stop that any easier than I could stop breathing. Uh, which means I could do it for maybe a few minutes, and then uh, that's about as far as I can go. But um, that can't be at the expense of the other important things for me. And number one is um, I want to stay married. My wife's my best friend. And I vowed early on I would not be one of those entrepreneurs on their sixth company, but also on their sixth wife. But that if I wanted that to be the case, I couldn't take it for granted. I had to invest the time to make sure I stayed connected to her. And that I have three kids and that I wanted them to grow up knowing me and me knowing them. And then the third piece is I'm cursed by having the thing that makes me personally whole is outdoors stuff. And I say cursed because the things I like doing is going off and doing a four-day climbing expedition. I love going up and kayaking a river in the northern uh, Alaska that takes you know almost two days of flying to get there. These are the types of things you cannot squeeze in between your 11 o'clock call and your 2 o'clock meeting. Um, and then if I was going to be able to feed the rat, I had to make space for it. So it was balance for me. So that's my answer, that you can't invert the pyramid because that doesn't work either. But you have to at some point be taking pieces from all of them at the same time. And listen, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, not a philosopher, and it certainly isn't one size fits all. But I'm really, really certainly proud of the things I've accomplished in business, but I'm equally proud of the fact that I've spent my entire life every year getting out and climbing and surfing and biking and hiking and doing these things which make me smile um, for days. And perhaps most proud of doing all those things while staying married to the same woman and having my kids grow up knowing me and best I can tell liking me. Um, and that's, that's pretty good. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going.
like I say, man. Always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot that hang from the rear view. Uh-huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you. Uh-huh. Backseat drivers got nothing but two cents. Shotgun riders too biased, they all liars. I should get an A for effort, I'm too tired. But I'm never giving up, that's why I'm kinda admired. Role model, like it or not, I gotta play it. Sugarcoat the rhyme sometimes, but still say it. Said I was quitting at 40, it's just a fib. I'm still a kid that's wiping the food off of my bib. You ever wanted something so bad that you could taste it? Cried over everything. Every opportunity wasted yeah. Good and bad news Which one you want first Either way you pick the bad Still gon' hurt you the worst I never got the bask In the fruits of the label uh-uh. And I never got the cash From that dude from the label I'm just thinking back